Gordon Kosa. Did I say your last name right, Gordon? Yeah, yeah close, cozy. Cozy. I'm going to talk about a, a program that we are in the course of doing um, under ARPA-E funding, and it, it's with participation from the, the Nuclear Reactor Lab, Nuclear Science and Engineering at MIT, and also from NPR Associates, one of whom is obviously familiar to you all. Charles Forsberg is involved on in this one as well. David Carpenter, who's a longtime uh, member of NRL, currently leads our radiation engineering group, is uh, is going to be is doing the, the main design of the experimental parts. Um, and we have Ming De Lee. Um, I won't be talking a lot about his role today because I'm concentrating on the irradiation, but, but as part of this program, we're also looking at um, some developing some new methods um, for doing um, radiation field scanning that would be it will be uh, applicable for RPIE, but also of eventual use um, we expect in people trying to operate plants, both pilot and full-scale plants, to know what's going on with the radiation fields. And then at NPR, we have Storm Kaufman and Valentina Angelici, and they are helping us with trying to make sure that the experiments that we do are relevant um, to the to the community and that once we've done those experiments that the results get out to that community so that's that's their role in all of this our title is perhaps a little bit ambitious in in that we are um, taking first steps towards generating irradiation data for for digital twinning of um, molten salt reactors obviously um, as other speakers today have pointed out there are huge Huge data gaps um, and a lot of work remains to be done. So what we want to do is come at this from a little bit different angle. We want our finding and will irradiate and quantitatively analyze an integrated test facility for production and transport of radioactive material in a molten fuel salt. So obviously the steps involved there are safety analysis and handling of the of the salt. Um, improved radiation transport and CFD predictions for, for the salt system, model development for the radionuclide generation and transport. We need to extend our previous static salt irradiation that Charles talked about um, to larger quantities. And um, in this case, the plan is to create a natural convection loop so that we have going to add some flow. And then, as I said, we want to implement a radiation field imaging facility using newly developed directional detection algorithms. So as I said today, I'm going to mostly talk about the, um, the planned irradiation side of it, um, but there will be information coming out on, on the other aspects as well. We needed to decide what kind of an experiment we're going to do. Um, partly, too, we're aiming to uh, establish a facility and methodologies that will be applicable to a variety of possible um, systems. Um, but we have to decide on an experiment to do first. And so for a variety of reasons, talking with um, some of the, the players in the game, um, we're, we're looking at um, probably doing an initial experiment with a clean salt and then moving on to a, a fueled or perhaps even just contaminated kind of salt afterwards. Um, but, you know, this is the kind of range of things that we're looking at. So um, obviously around 600, 650 C um, and we will be targeting flow rates as high as we can. We don't expect that with the natural convection system, we'll be able to get up to prototypical flow rates. And also that's one of the areas where we, we actually have the least information about what the flow rates are actually going to be in terms of velocities, um, which is of course uh, the, um, the important part here. Um, but at any rate, so this is sort of the the some of the information that we're looking at in deciding what to do, um, and we will be circling back um, to hear more about what what tests are of greatest interest to the community as we go along. Charles has already showed you some um, some pictures of the reactor, and I, I know some of you are probably a little bit familiar with with our research reactor. We're a, a six megawatt um, reactor operated at MIT in Cambridge. Um, and um, this, so part of the part of the issue here, and we have done, um, as Charles mentioned, a number of capsule experiments in the core of the reactor, um, where we actually have 
uh, neutron flux and spectrum pretty close to what you would find in a light water power reactor. So very relevant for, um, for power reactor kinds of experiments. The problem is that as a, um, as a research reactor in the United States, we are not permitted to, or, or we have very strict controls on how we're allowed to do um, fuel experiments in the core of the reactor. So our salt experiments in the core were unfueled salt because we aren't allowed to run, uh, we can only put in um, solid fuel in samples into the, um, into the core. So the, the facility that Charles described is one way around that problem, um, and it will take a while to get that in place. In the meantime, another way around that problem is to put a, a facility into our graphite reflector region. Um, so the core is here, we have a D2O reflector and then a graphite reflector. So we have actually about, um, uh, I'll say a little bit more about this in, in a slide or two. We have about 10 to the 13th neutrons per square centimeter. And second in this area, it is almost entirely thermal. There's very little fast flux out there, as you could imagine, after going through tank of deuterium and then into the graphite. We're pretty much um, a thermal spectrum out there. But it does allow us, um, for the reasons that Charles described, to be able to use molten fuel and put um, ha have a wider range of possibilities for experiments in that region. Okay, so our irradiation position is a so-called so MIT 3GV graphite reflector position. So that's shown here, so you'll recognize, I hope this is the reactor um, core tank here, um, the, the uh, D2O reflector surrounding that, and I've taken away the, the D2O and the graphite here so that we can see um, this uh, facility that's going to be lowered down in and will operate um, at basically the reactor core midline, um, getting about one times 10 to the 13th neutrons per square centimeter in second. The nice part about this facility as well, um, uh, compared to in-core facilities, is that it is bigger. So we have about uh, six and a half centimeter maximum diameter that we can use, and about 46 centimeters of active core height. Um, we will be double encapsulating the fuel salt um, to isolate direct primary off gas, um, and we'll be um, putting in a lot of local temperature monitoring and control, which I'm going to show you what that, that looks like in, in just a minute. Um, and we also have access to the area above the core, which um, the whole system is cooled, um, and that will allow us to promote natural convection flow. And so the whole idea here is to produce transport and deposit fission and activation and corrosion products so that we can see how they behave um, and plan for what that will look like eventually in a reactor. So this is what the facility is going to look like. It's pretty small and pretty simple, um, partly because the idea is to make it fairly modular so that we can easily change out these experiments to look at different materials and different salts. Um, and the, the basic idea is to have the, you know, the, the green um, tubing there. It's simply a loop of tubing that will be um, filled with salt, um, heated by a combination of electric heating and, um, and nuclear heating, and then cooled by conduction to the, um, to the walls of the, of the facility. We can also, in the areas where there is a gap between the heated part of the facility and the, and the wall, the cooled wall, we can control the thermal conductivity there using a mixture of helium and neon gas so that we can, that gives us another um, control wheel to, to be able to, to drive this thing at the, at the temperatures um, that we want and to produce um, salt flow by natural convection. Okay, so this is just a little bit different view, um, and so here you can see that, that the um, you know, the facility will be centered in um, the, you know, the radiation capsule will be centered in the facility cooling jacket, um, and will be placed in this thermal block to provide heat transfer from our heaters um, to the loop, and the the heaters will be zoned 
so that we can drive the, the natural convection that, that we're looking for. So most of this, again, similar to the, the first experiment that we heard about today, um, we will be able to drive this with electric heating and we actually will be getting a relatively small contribution um, from, from nuclear heating in the, once the, the reactor gets turned on. But um, as with all of these um, experiments, we do like to keep things hot, even if we have some problems and the reactor needs to go down for some reason. Just um, some parameters for what the facility is going to look like. Um, we are finalizing the design right now, so these may be um, subject to a little bit of change, but um, essentially we're looking at a total height of the, the system, about 40 centimeters um, flow diameter in, in around the um, six to ten um, millimeter range and you can see the the planned um, temperatures in the different zones we need a relatively large loop delta t in order to drive the the flow um, and we will be putting in a reasonably large salt volume at about 100 cc's our current plan will at least for the first experiment will be to go with 316h for the wetted surfaces and as i described um, just a minute ago the idea is to have uh, zoned heating plus nuclear heating um, and control of the cooling through a, a graphite heat sink out to the water cooled outer jackets all of which would allows us to um, to drive the natural convection flow and um, Again, most of the um, most of the information that we'll be getting from this system is going to come from from PIE. So we are only planning really at the moment to be looking mainly at um, at least for for control purposes, we'll be looking at temperatures, um, and we will be monitoring off gases, but not directly from from the salt. So most of the information is coming from PIE, and mostly um, aimed at looking at where various activities get to um, after the after they've been circulating around for a while. One of the reasons for doing this was to try to get an experiment that we could put together and do very quickly or fairly quickly um, and then add sophistication to other features, different materials as we go along. So you can see that most of the the systems that we want to use for this are already available. So mainly the idea is that we have to finish the design of the irradiation vehicle itself, demonstrate that we can get some uh, reasonable natural convection flow. Um, and then we are really, at least as far as the experiment is concerned, ready to go. And um, again, I don't have time today to talk about the PIE so much, but we will be, we are already working and we'll continue to work on some fixturing and new methodology for, for basically mapping the activities around the system after irradiation. This is somewhat preliminary, um, but most likely we will do a, a first irradiation with unfueled fly salt with 316H um, and graphite components. Irradiation times are, are likely to be short. Again, what we're looking for really here is not to provide data that's going to take us, you know, we don't have the Practically, we can't look at long times for, for a plant, but to start understanding how this transport works and to be able to, to benchmark um, some codes that can uh, predict this so that we can extend out from here. Um, and as we learn more, we, we obviously can go for longer irradiations as well. Initially, there'll be fairly short irradiations. The, the other advantage of this, of the graphite reflector position is that we aren't limited to the reactor um, cycle times. We can do shorter irradiations, pull them up out of the flux, and then transfer them out through the shielded cast that you saw earlier. And then once we've got that established, that's also you know somewhat of a, a shakedown for the system, um, the idea would be to go on to a second irradiation with um, a fueled fly or perhaps even a fueled um, other salt type, probably initially at low fuel concentrations and extending a radiation time out to establish some uh, reasonable concentrations of fission products so that we can see where they go. And then, as I say, future radiations, um, TBD, based on how well we do with this, what we can learn and what um, the, the interests are in the community. This is final thing just to um, 
you know, show maybe a little bit more, give you a little bit clearer idea of what some of this looks like. This is an earlier experiment that we did, one of our, our capsule irradiations, and essentially this one was designed to generate tritium in a somewhat realistic salt environment in order to look at how that um, permeated through various materials. But again, it just gives you some idea of, of what these systems look like um, and how they get down into the vertical irradiation facility. And, you know, to indicate that with um, our previous experiments, we do have some experience in, in the salt loading and removing these experiments for, for PIE and so on. And all of this is actually um, quite symbiotic with work that's going on on the, the system that Charles described. And also we are working with Commonwealth Fusion Systems um, that, that as, as Charles said, are using, planning to use FLIB as a, as a blanket for their fusion design. And so we are trying to pool our technological resources as much as possible in those areas. So I think with that, I will conclude Thank you, Gordon. Uh, I, I like how you're really taking your experiment and, and going back to the mod sim and, and showing the importance of doing both. So I, I think that this will be a really impactful study.